Welcome to Chapter 8, Green Building. In this chapter, we will take a look at the various ways that buildings in the coming years will take into account sustainability, including the designs for the buildings and the materials used to create them. Green building requires rethinking the selection of materials. Ideally, materials and resources used for buildings not only do less harm, but go further and regenerate the natural and social environments from which they originate. To evaluate the best options and weigh the trade-offs associated with a selection, teams must think beyond a project's physical and temporal boundaries. What are the main areas of focus around materials and resource choices? Conservation of material. A building generates a large amount of waste through its life cycle. Meaningful waste reduction begins with eliminating the need for materials during the planning and design phases. Environmentally preferable materials. Locally harvested, sustainably grown, made from rapidly renewable materials, biodegradable and free of toxins. All of these designations demonstrate awareness for sustainability. Energy systems such as heating and cooling systems that are efficient. Waste management and reduction. The goal is to reduce the waste that is hauled to and disposed of in landfills or incineration facilities. During construction or renovation, materials should be recycled or reused whenever possible. During the building's daily operations, recycling, reuse, and reduction programs can curb the amount of material destined for local landfills. And finally, the health components that need to be addressed for those living or working in the building. Materials for a green building are obtained from natural, renewable sources that have been managed and harvested in a sustainable way, or they are obtained locally to reduce the embedded energy costs of transportation or salvage from reclaimed materials at nearby sites. Materials are assessed using green specifications that look at their life cycle analysis in terms of their embodied energy, durability, recycled content, waste minimization, and their ability to be reused or recycled. A few examples of green materials include stone and bamboo, among others. Stone is one example of a green building material. Living in a stone structure is low maintenance and eco-friendly, and any extra stone left over from the build can be used for home furnishings such as countertops or tile. Building with stone doesn't release harmful chemicals or toxins into the interior of your home, and because it occurs naturally, you don't need other resources to create the material itself. Because stone is stunning on its own, you'll also save on paint and finish, and the reliability of stone structures make it an easy building to ensure. Some of the benefits of stone include low maintenance, Stone requires little maintenance and cleaning over time, so upkeep costs for homeowners will be low. It's durable. This material works well in various climates, is fire resistant, and should fare well during a natural disaster. Another example is bamboo. The strength and look of bamboo can help you achieve a distinctive style to make your home stand out. It's also one of the fastest growing plants on the planet, so it is more sustainable than most. Because home insurers classify bamboo homes as frame constructions, insurance rates are higher than other bills, such as stone and adobe, due to fire concerns. However, some benefits of bamboo include, it's very durable. Bamboo has a greater tensile strength than steel and can withstand compression better than concrete and it is also very lightweight. Bamboo is easy and cheap to transport to a construction site thanks to its hollow sections, saving money during the build. Buildings have a significant share of energy consumption globally and regionally. Particularly during the usage phase of the building's life cycle, a lot of energy is consumed to provide comfort conditions inside the building. The high proportion of buildings consuming energy also increases the use of fossil fuel-based resources. Environmental issues arising from energy uses are thus also growing. 
Whereas buildings appropriate to the use of renewable energy sources can be built using passive or active methods. It is clear that the use of renewable energy sources in buildings will provide environmental and economic benefits. Reducing the, uh, this amount of energy as much as possible and obtaining it from renewable sources is one of the effective methods that provide buildings with the energy efficiency and ecological characteristics. Renewable energy sources can be utilized from the sun with active and passive methods for heating, cooling, ventilation, natural lighting, and obtaining hot water. Wind energy is also utilized in ventilation and cooling with active and passive systems. Geothermal energy can be used for heating and cooling purposes. It can be used in heating and hot water supply from hydrogen energy cooking and for supplying electricity. Biomass energy is beneficial for heating and hot water supply. These resources can be used together if necessary. In renewable energy use, Passive systems should be referred, preferred because it is simpler and more cost effective. In cases where passive systems are inadequate, they should be supported with active systems. By using renewable energies where these conditions are possible, the use of fossil based energies is reduced and many environmental and economic benefits are provided. However, in order to spread the use of renewable energy sources in buildings, it is deemed necessary and important for governments to prepare the necessary laws and regulations and to have sanctions and incentives for their implementation. Considering water efficiency in green buildings, today several technologies are being used, including rainwater harvesting, recycling and reuse of gray water, low flow fixtures, sensors, etc. Water efficiency measures in residential and commercial buildings can greatly reduce wastewater, yielding lower sewage volumes, reduced energy use, and bring in financial benefits too. In simple terms, rainwater harvesting is the active collection and distribution of rainwater, which rather than going to the sewage is put into use in daily life. Typically, rainwater is collected from the rooftops deposited in a reservoir with filtration. Once the water is purified, it can be used for cultivation, gardening, and other domestic uses. One of the biggest uses of rainwater harvesting is in drier states where there is a lower rate of rainfall. They can store this water and can later purify it to make it usable water or can use it for washing or watering plants. Gray water can be defined as untreated wastewater that has not come into contact with water closest waste. Basically eliminates, emanates from showers, bathtubs, bathroom wash basins, washing machines, and dishwashers. Treatments of gray water can include filtering, settlement of solids, flotation and separation of lighter solids, aerobic and anaerobic digestion, chemical or UV disinfection. But again, irrespective of the treatment of such water, it is never safe to drink, but can be used for flushing toilets, washing clothes, and irrigation purposes. One of the major benefits of recycling gray water is that it is a huge source with low concentration of organic matter. These days, pressure reducing valves are being very commonly installed in high-rise residential and commercial buildings to help maintain consistent water pressure at the water fixtures across the entire building from top to bottom. With these higher pressures, water flows through the system with greater flow through the terminal fixtures beyond rated flow capacities. This additional water is wasted and it serves no extra benefit to the rated performance. Green buildings make use of evaporative cooling systems to save on energy. Such systems use water for cooling. Keeping in mind the huge need to conserve water, the water used such cooling towers is non-potable water and the same is not drained out but recycled time and time again. Low flow plumbing fixtures like faucets, shower heads, and toilets have become increasingly common feature in green homes today and for good reason. 
Large quantities of water are saved by the use of plumbing fixtures which are designed to operate with less water. For example, toilets were once made to function using 7 gallons per flush, but these days they can efficiently operate using only 1.3 gallons. Clearly this means a water savings of over 80%. Using non-toxic materials and products will improve indoor air quality and reduce the rate of asthma, allergy, and sick building syndrome. These materials are emission-free, have low or no VOC or volatile organic compounds, and are moisture-resistant to deter mold, spores, and other microbes. Indoor air quality is also addressed through ventilation systems and materials that control humidity and allow a building to breathe. The following are the key components to achieve a healthier work environment. Ventilation in buildings is required to bring fr fresh air in from the outside and dilute occupant generated pollutants. This is especially important during the pandemic. The more fresh air, the healthier the space. The reports, reports suggest to filter outdoor and recirculated air with a minimum removal efficiency of 75% for all particle size fractions, including at the nanoscale. Indoor air quality depends on the presence and abundance of pollutants in the air, indoor air environment that may cause harm. It includes chemical and biological pollutants in gas, liquid, or solid states that we are exposed to indoors. <clears throat> There's a re report suggests to maintain humidity levels between 30 to 60 percent to mitigate odor issues. From the recommendations that the, the report suggests, the range of humidity should actually be higher than 30% because the humidity will help bring down virus droplets, lowering the amount of time they are in the air. Thermal health refers to thermal comfort standards for temperature and humidity. Recommended guidance is to keep conditions consistent throughout the day. During the pandemic, you will find that you will probably need to flush your building with fresh air before and after school, which will create inconsistent levels of temperatures and humidity. According to some studies, 61% of total drinking water intake comes from tap. However, many of the country's water pipes and mains are reaching end of their useful life, which increases the concern for contamination. Healthy buildings have a water supply that meets the U.S. national drinking water standards and is tested regularly. It is recommended to conduct regular inspections of roofing, plumbing, ceiling, and HVAC equipment to identify sources of moisture and potential condensation spots. When moisture or mold is found, the moisture source must be immediately addressed and dried or replaced the contaminated materials. Identify and remediate underlying sources of the moisture issue. Many contaminants reside in dust and lead to exposure in three different ways. Inhalation of resuspended dust, direct dermal absorption, which is through the skin, or ingestion from hand-to-mouth behaviors. Use high-efficiency filter vacuums in clean surfaces regularly to limit dust and dirt accumulation, which are reservoirs for chemical allergens and metals. This one might not be easy to control in some buildings. However, th there are studies that recommend a background noise of 35 decibels in, in areas where concentration needs to take place. The safety and security category includes sufficient lighting, video monitoring, incident reporting protocols, fire safety preparations, and maintaining an emergency action plan. These can ease safety concerns and reduce stress of occupants within a building. And finally, all work and habitation spaces, spaces should have direct lines of sight to exterior windows. There should be sufficient lighting for work and living as much and as much natural daylight as possible without causing glare. The Leadership in Energy and Environmental Design 
was developed in the United States to promote green building starting in the 1990s. LEED certified buildings save money, improve efficiency, lower, lower carbon emissions, and create healthier places for people. They are critical to addressing climate change and meeting environmental goals, enhancing resilience, and supporting more equitable communities. LEED categories also contribute towards meeting the UN Sustainable Development Goals. To achieve LEED certification, a project earns points by adhering to prerequisites and credits that address carbon, energy, water, waste, transportation, materials, health, and indoor environmental quality. LEED is a holistic system that doesn't simply focus on one building element, such as energy, water, or health. Instead, it looks at the big picture, factoring in all critical elements that work together to create the best building possible. The goal of LEED is to create better buildings that reduce contribution to global climate change, enhance individual human health, protect and restore water resources, protect and enhance biodiversity and ecosystem services, promote sustainable and regenerative material cycles, and finally enhance community quality of life. Of all LEED credits, 35% relate to climate change, 20% directly impact human health, 15% impact water resources, 10% affect biodiversity, and 10% relate to the green economy, and finally 5% impact community and natural resources. One of the most significant ways that we can impact the environment is by choosing where to build structures. The primary goals for green buildings in selecting a site are protecting sensitive sites, preserving undeveloped sites, restoring and reusing previously developed sites, reducing impact on flora and fauna, promoting connection to the community, and finally minimizing transportation impacts both the environment and energy use. There are several factors that go into site selection of a new building, particularly a green building. The site selection and site plan must fill, fulfill all of the regulations, including eco-sensitive zone regulations, coastal zone regulations, and any other specific local bylaws. The site selection must take into account minimizing land disturbances by selecting previously disturbed lands, sites that are close to public transportation, community and work centers, and services such as pumping water and transport transporting electricity. The site selection should also take into account minimizing long-term impacts on the community, creating neighborhoods with compactness, connectivity, and walkable streets. Site selection should incorporate climate zones and local hydrology that will have an impact on building design. The same type of building will be designed in a different way depending on outdoor temperature, outdoor humidity, and solar ra radiation. The design varies in various aspects depending on where you are, such as wall materials and assembly, size and orientation of windows, heating system selection, methods for controlling moisture, and types of vegetation available for landscaping. And finally, a site selection should encourage using less polluting modes of transportation. We will now take an in-depth look at the 11 factors on the slide that go into a site selection for a green building. Let's get started. As you can see on the slide, there are numerous site considerations that need to be avoided when choosing a site. For example, a flood hazard area shown on a legally adopted flood hazard map or otherwise legally designated by local jurisdiction or state cannot be used as a site. Land that is identified as habitat for species listed as threatened or endangered under the U.S. Endangered Species Act or the state's Endangered Species Act cannot be used as a site as well. Also, areas on or within 100 feet of a body of water, except for minor improvements, cannot be considered. And finally, areas within 50 feet of a wetland 
except for minor improvements, cannot be considered as a site. These are just a few of the examples of the protecting of sensitive sites that need to be taken into consideration. Greenfield sites are vacant, undeveloped tracts of land that are available for business or industrial use. They are referred to as greenfields because often their former usage, or in some case current usage, is agriculture production. Greenfield sites are most often located in the urban fringe of the path of development or in rural areas where undeveloped land is more likely to be present. Greenfield sites present a number of development advantages to locating business and industry provided they meet basic needs such as access to utilities and close proximity to adequate transportation resources. Since they have never been used for business, industry, or other uses than agriculture, there is little danger of prior contamination leading to potential environmental problems and expensive cleanup costs. The sites are vacant and, other than necessary site preparation and grading, are ready for construction, reducing the time needed until the company can be in operation. Brownfield sites, or brownfield development areas, are previously developed and abandoned areas of land that may have been contaminated by hazardous materials or pollution. The projects are more complex. These kinds of land use uses have become increasingly attractive as it becomes more difficult to find viable land near urban areas. Government incentives are in place to encourage the cleanup and revitalization of abandoned commercial land. The term grayfield is economically obsolete, outdated, failing or underused real estate assets or land. The term was coined in the early 2000s from the sea of empty asphalt that often accompanies these sites. The term has historically been applied to former viable retail and commercial shopping sites, such as regional malls and strip centers, that have suffered from the lack of reinvestment and have been outclassed by larger, better designed, better anchored malls or shopping sites. These particular Grayfield sites are often referred to as dead malls or ghost boxes if the anchor or other major tenants have vacated the premises, leaving behind empty shells. Protection of natural features. Earth disturbance activities such as clearing and grading the land surface can impact the vegetation and soils that protect lakes. Without restoration, these impacts can last for many years. Earth disturbance also increases the potential for sediment discharges into lakes and rivers, carrying nutrients and pollutants. Clearing reduces natural uptake of water and nutrients by vegetation and excessive grading can smooth the ground surface, increasing the amount of velocity and runoff into local waterways. Selecting a suitable building location that does not contain steep grades and or significant vegetation, you'd like to minimize the site disturbance footprint by designing to maintain existing natural topography as much as possible. Cluster buildings and identify opportunities to reduce or share parking areas and driveways. On redevelopment sites, you can build within the existing disturbed footprint. Avoid grading that re requires excess cut or placement fill. And during construction, clear, establish clearly marked boundaries to minimize disturbance of existing sites. You can also locate buildings, roads, parking areas, and other structures to maintain existing topography and to minimize the extent of the disturbance. Heat island reduction. Structures such as buildings, roads, and other infrastructure absorb and re-emit the sun's heat more than natural landscapes such as forests and water bodies. Urban areas where these structures are highly concentrated and greenery is limited become quote-unquote islands of higher temperatures relative to outlying areas. These pockets of heat are referred to as heat islands. Heat islands can form under a variety of conditions, including during the day or night, in small or large cities, in suburban areas, in northern or southern climates, and in any season. 
A review of research studies and data found that in the United States, the heat island effect results in daytime temperatures in urban areas about 1 to 7 degrees Fahrenheit higher than temperatures in outlying areas and nighttime temperatures about 2 to 5 degrees Fahrenheit higher. Humid regions, primarily in the eastern United States, and cities with larger and denser populations experience the greatest temperature differences. Research predicts that the heat island effect will strengthen in the future as the structure, spatial extent, and population density of urban areas change and grow. Heat islands form as a result of several factors. First is reduced natural landscape in urban areas. Trees, vegetation, and water bodies tend to cool the air by providing shade, transpiring water and from plant leaves, and evaporating surface water, respectively. Hard, dry surfaces in urban areas such as roofs, sidewalks, roads, buildings, and parking lots provide less shade and moisture than natural landscapes and therefore contribute to higher temperatures. Urban material properties. Conventional human-made materials used in urban environments such as pavements or roofing tend to reflect less solar energy and absorb and emit more of the sun's heat compared to trees, vegetation, and other natural surfaces. Often, heat islands build throughout the day and become more pronounced after sunset due to the slow release of heat from urban materials. Urban geometry. The dimensions and spacing of buildings within a city influence wind flow and urban materials' ability to absorb and release solar energy. In heavily developed areas, surfaces and structures obstructed by neighboring buildings will become thermal masses that cannot release their heat readily. Cities with many narrow streets and tall buildings become urban canyons, which can block natural wind flow that would bring the cooling effects. Heat generated from human activities. Vehicles, air conditioning units, buildings, and industrial facilities all emit heat into the urban environment. These sources of human generated waste heat can contribute to heat effects. Weather and geography. Calm and clear weather conditions result in more severe heat islands by maximizing the amount of solar energy reaching urban surfaces and minimizing the amount of heat that can be carried away. Conversely, strong winds and cloud cover suppress heat island formation. Geographic features can also impact the heat island effect. For example, nearby mountains can block wind from reaching a city or create wind patterns that pass through a city. Many communities are taking action to reduce urban heat islands using five main strategies. First, increasing tree and vegetative cover. Second, installing green roofs. Three, installing cool, mainly reflective roofs. Four, using cool pavements, either reflective or permeable. And five, utilizing smart growth practices. There are several strategies and technologies to reduce the heat island effect, including the following. Trees and vegetation. Increasing tree and vegetation cover lowers surface and air temperatures by providing shade and cooling through evapotranspiration. Trees and vegetation can also reduce stormwater runoff and protect against erosion. Green roofs. Green, growing a vegetative layer on a rooftop reduces temperatures of the roof surface and surrounding air and improves stormwater management. Also called rooftop gardens or eco roofs, green roofs achieves these benefits by providing shade and removing heat from the air through evapotranspiration. Cool roofs. Installing a cool roof one made of materials or coatings that significantly reflects sunlight and heat away from a building, reduces roof temperatures, increases the comfort of occupants, and lowers energy demand. Cool pavements. 
Using pavement materials on sidewalks, parking lots, and streets that remain cooler than conventional pavements by reflecting more solar energy and enhancing water evaporation not only cools the pavement surface and surrounding air, but can also reduce stormwater runoff and improve nighttime visibility. Finally, smart growth. These practices cover a range of development and conservation strategies that help protect the natural environment and at the same time make our communities more attractive, economically stronger, and more livable. Site Waste Management Construction staff manage and dispose of building materials and other construction site waste to reduce the risk of pollution or to stormwater. Practices such as trash disposal, recycling, Proper material handling and spill prevention and cleanup measures can reduce the potential for stormwater flow to mobilize construction site wastes and contaminate surface or groundwater. Proper management and disposal of waste will reduce pollution and stormwater discharge from any construction site. Good waste management practices include properly locating refuse piles, covering materials that stormwater discharges might displace, and preventing spills and leaks from hazardous materials. Waste management practices vary depending on the type of waste being managed, whether it is hazardous or whether it might contaminate stormwater. Below are examples of management practices for different categories of construction waste. For solid waste, there are several considerations that must be made, including the following. Designate a waste collection area on site that does not receive a substantial amount of stormwater flow from upland areas and does not drain directly into a water body. Clean up spills immediately. Use an absorbent material such as sawdust or cat litter to contain the spill. Finally, collect, remove, and dispose of all construction site wastes at authorized disposal areas. Contact a local environmental agency to identify these disposal sites. For hazardous waste, there are several considerations that must be made, including the following. For spills of hazardous waste, follow cleanup instructions on the package or, if applicable, the Safe to Data Worksheet. Consult with local waste management authorities about the requirement for disposing of hazardous wastes. Never remove the original product label from the container. It contains important safety information. Follow the manufacturer's recommended method for, of disposal, which should appear on the label. Never mix excess products when disposing of them, unless the manufacturer specifically re recommends doing so. And finally, for soils containing hazardous substances, consult with state or local solid waste regulatory agencies or private firms to ensure a proper disposal. Some landfills might accept contaminated soils, but they require laboratory tests first. Greener forms of transportation. Sites selected should preferably be within walking distance located near to and closely connected with the existing system of public or mass traffic and transportation so as to enable the residents to use these model modes of travel in a convenient manner. This will help in minimizing the use of personal vehicles for intra-city travel and promote the use of public transport. There are several eco-friendly forms of transportation that could be considered when making a site selection, including the following. Electric vehicles, which are powered by an electric motor rather than an internal combustion engine, and they use electricity as their fuel source. Hybrid vehicles are powered by an internal combustion engine as well as an electric motor, and they use gasoline as their fuel source. Bicycles are human-powered vehicles that require no fuel at all. Electric scooters, which are powered by an electric motor using electricity. Walking, which uses no fuel at all. Public transportation such as buses, trains, or subways use electricity or petroleum-based fuels. Carpooling is when two or more people share rides in one car instead of each person driving separately in their own car. This reduces the number of cars on the road and helps to conserve fuel. Ride sharing is when two people use a rideshare app to book a shared ride with someone else going in the same direction. This reduces the number of cars on the road and helps to conserve fuel as well. 
Electric bicycles are powered by an electric motor and use electricity as their fuel source. They can be pedaled like a regular bicycle, but also have an electric motor to assist with propulsion. And finally, electric skateboards are powered by an electric motor and use electricity as well. Light pollution, which is unwanted or excessive artificial light. Like noise pollution, light pollution is a form of waste energy that can cause adverse effects and degrade environmental quality. Moreover, because light, is typically generated by electricity, which itself is usually generated by the combustion of fossil fuels, it can be said that there is a connection between light pollution and air pollution from fossil fuel power plant emissions. Control of light pollution, therefore, will help to conserve fuel and reduce air pollution as well as mitigate the more immediate problems caused by excessive light. Although light pollution may not appear to be as harmful to public health and welfare as pollution from, of water resources or the atmosphere, it is an environmental quality issue of no small, so small significance. Light pollution adversely affects professional and amateur astronomers as well as casual observers of the night sky because it severely reduces the visibility of stars and other celestial objects. The reduction in the night sky visibility is a result of sky glow, upward directed light emanating from poorly designed and directed lamps and security floodlights. This wasted light is scattered and reflected by solid or liquid particles in the atmosphere and then returned to the eyes of the people on the ground, obliterating, obliterating their view of the night sky. The effect of sky glow from a town or city is not necessarily localized. It can be observed from the main source, far from the main source. Site strategies and energy use in site selection. While selecting a site, it must be ensured that the shape of the site should be such that it allows proper planning, designing, and placement of buildings. Regular sites should be preferred as compared to irregular sites. A site must ensure proper air, light, and ventilation within the building designed. Accordingly, too deep and too narrow sites with large depth as compared to width or larger width as compared to depth should be avoided for proper designing of buildings and making provision of parking. Sites having irregular boundaries forming acute angles should be avoided. Acute angled sites lead to creation of deep pockets which lead to inefficient use of sites as compared to sites having obtuse angles. Areas of the site should also be adequate to accommodate the covered area worked out as per scope of a project. While selecting sites, all low-lying sites in areas which are prone to flooding must be avoided for any likely damage to the building in the future. In this regard, levels of the sites with respect to adjoining land must be visited along with the past history of flood in the area before a decision can be made. Undulating sites have inherent limitations in terms of their planning, designing, development, and placement of buildings as compared to level or flat sites, and accordingly topography and physical structure of land must be evaluated before finalizing. In hilly areas where flat lands are not available, selection of the site should be based on involving minimum cutting and filling with contours and gradient providing enough options to design buildings along the contours. A slope study must be entail gradient, landforms, elevation, drainage patterns, etc. for site study and analysis. Considering the magnitude of the projects, undulating sites can be an asset for creating sustainable design options depending on the architectural solutions which can be leveraged effectively or and efficiently for converting them from a challenge to opportunities. Orientation of buildings shall be invariably valued and considered while site selecting. Sites providing best orientation should be preferred for planning and designing green buildings. 
It will be easier to achieve sustainability on sites having good orientation considering the prevailing climate in the zone. One of the important goals of green projects is to mitigate the negative environmental effects of stormwater runoff and reduce the use of outdoor potable water on the site. Impervious surfaces, buildings, and conventional storm drainage systems prevent rainwater from percolating into the soil. Surface runoff, also known as overland flow, is the flow of water occurring on the ground surface when excess rainwater, stormwater, meltwater, or other sources can no longer sufficiently rapidly infiltrate the soil. Storm and site water conservation. When rainwater hits an impervious surface, it meets whatever pollutants resides on that surface. That could include road salt, sediment, or trash, oil, heavy metals, or toxic chemicals from cars and trucks, pesticides or fertilizers from lawns and gardens, and even viruses or bacteria from animal waste. These contaminants turn pristine rainfall into dirty runoff and an estimated 10 trillion gallons of which enter U.S. waters from cities untreated each year. Just an inch of rainfall on one mile of narrow two-lane road can produce 55,000 gallons of stormwater runoff. When funneled through a storm drain, the sudden entry of so much runoff can damage and erode delicate banks of waterways, resulting in land and habitat loss and changing a waterway's basic morphology. Instead of separate storm drains, nearly 860 mun municipalities across the United States use combined so sewer systems, which dump storm water runoff into the same pipes that are used for domestic sewage and industrial wastewater. Unfortunately, these sewer systems are designed to overflow when storm water exceeds their capacity. A big storm, in other words, can cause an excess mess of both runoff and raw sewage to be released in waterways. In New York City alone, about 27 billion gallons of this noxious mixture pour from nearly 460 outfalls every year. Heavy rains have gotten more frequent and intense in the United States over the past 50 years, with climate change making matters worse and increasing the risk of flooding and sewer system overflows. Indeed, the average size of a 100-year floodplain is likely to increase 45% by century's end, according to the Environmental Protection Agency. Another growing problem is urban flooding caused by too much rain on impervious surfaces such as pavement, urban floods can destroy neighborhoods. They particularly affect low-income neighborhoods and communities of color and can leave behind health problems like asthma and illness caused by mold. Green infrastructure reduces flood risks and bolsters the climate resiliency of communities by capturing rain where it falls and keeping it out of storms and waterways. More than half of the rain that falls in urban areas, which are covered mostly by impervious surfaces, ends up as runoff. Green infrastructure practices reduce runoff by capturing stormwater and allowing it to recharge groundwater supplies or be harvested for purposes like landscaping and toilet flushing. That reduces demand on municipal water supplies even more important because of decreased rainfall, reduced snowpack and earlier snowmelt brought on by drought and hotter temperatures that can come with climate change. Green infrastructure promotes rainfall conservation through the use of capture methods and infiltration techniques. A key part of managing the pollution from stormwater runoff is prevention. Green infrastructure keeps waterways clean and healthier in two primary ways. First is water retention. Green infrastructure prevents runoff by capturing rain where it falls, allowing it to filter into the earth where it can replenish groundwater supplies, return it to the atmosphere through evapotranspiration, or be reused for other purposes such as landscaping. Second is water quality. 
Green infrastructure improves water quality by decreasing the amount of stormwater that reaches waterways and by removing contaminants from water that it does. Soils and plant helps ca capture and remove pollutants from stormwater in a variety of ways, including absorption, filtration, plant uptake, and the decomposition of organic matter. These processes break down or capture many of the common pollutants found in runoff from heavy metals to oil to bacteria. Transported water. Abundant access to water for manufacturing and other purposes has long ranked near the top of company site selection criteria, especially in drought prone regions. Recent weather and climate trends have made it even more of a vital concern Industries that withdraw large volumes of groundwater, including manufacturing, mining, oil and gas, energy generation, engineering, and construction. Those withdrawals sometimes deplete local public water supplies. For companies seeking to identify water-related issues, there are three steps important to consider. First, look at the current situation that is sources of water and how it is processed and generated from area rivers, aquifers, and mountain runoff. Second, consider the strategic plan for water going forward, different types of technology that can help gray water recycling, which is being seen in some places. And third, companies should do, do some modeling, including population growth and water consumption, based on expected growth for the next 30 to 50 years. Other site issues. Trees and vegetation, which are helpful for shading and protection from the energy effects of the sun, can also adversely contribute to humidity and other environmental problems if located adjacent to buildings. Trees can also threaten a building structure with their roots and branches. Leaves and small branches can protrude into the windows. Strategies to overcome the above concerns include providing a buffer zone between buildings and trees or vegetation, promote indoor environmental quality by protecting buildings from dirt and moisture. You can do this by installing walk-off mats at entrances or textured paving materials instead of gravel, and pro finally proper selection of landscaping materials and plants. In this section, we will take a look at the various building materials that can be considered to make a greener, more sustainable structure. Green building materials are composed of renewable rather than non-renewable resources. Green materials are environmentally responsible because impacts are considered over the life of the product. Specifying the right products can have a huge impact on sustainability. The steps involved in processing materials such as extraction, processing, and transportation can pollute air and water and use up natural resources. Using recycled or salvaged materials can help minimize waste products, while selecting local or lightweight materials can potentially reduce the environmental impact of transportation. What makes green products sustainable has to do with how they are developed, produced, harvested, etc., and how that impacts the future. Sustainable products are not just produced in a way that is friendly to and protects the environment, but is done in a manner that assures future generations will have the ability to do the same. For instance, wood lumber is considered a green product because trees are a renewable resource. However, if lumber manufacturers are harvesting forests in a way that will wipe them out completely, then it is not sustainable practice. The key is to harvest the lumber in a way that will allow the forest to continue to flourish and provide a continual supply of trees for harvesting. Green products and materials are those that have the characteristics such as energy efficiency, which reduces energy, renewable energy, such as solar, renewable resources such as bamboo and recycled materials, they have a low impact on the environment and low impact on health such as low VOC paint. Recycled materials are great sustainable building materials especially if, especially if they are locally sourced. Examples of recycled materials include reclaimed wood, recycled metal, and recycled glass. 
Reclaimed wood can be used in a variety of ways such as furniture, sliding barn doors, flooring, wall paneling, on ceilings, and much more. Recycled metal, such as steel, can accent a wall or ceiling. Like wood and metal, recycled glass has found many popular uses as a sustainable building material. Common applications for recycled glass include tile and countertops. Not only are these recycled materials green, sustainable products, but they can add great character to your home. Structural ins insulated panels, or SIPs, can be a good building material to consider when building a new home. Structural ins insulated panels are panels that have a foam core inside of the structure facings. One way to picture an, a structural insulated panel is to think of an Oreo cookie with cream filling, which would be the foam core, sandwiched between the two cookies, which are the structural facings. In lieu of traditional wood frame construction, structural insulated panels are manufactured at a facility in a controlled environment and delivered to a job site. The panels are then installed to form the exterior walls of a home. The insulated foam core provides insulation and energy efficiency, helping to reduce heating and cooling costs. The Forest Stewardship Council is an independent nonprofit organization that protects forests for future generations. It sets standards for responsible forest management. A voluntary program, FSC, uses the power of the marketplace to protect forests for future generations. FSC Forest Management Certification confirms that the forest is being managed in a way that preserves biological diversity and benefits the lives of local people and workers while ensuring it, can, it sustains economic viability. FSC certified forests are managed to strict environmental, social, and economic standards. Despite this noble cause, there have been some heavy criticism in recent years from other organizations as to FSC's handling of legal timber operations around the world. Indoor environmental quality is most simply described as conditions inside the building. It includes air quality, but also access to daylight and views, pleasant acoustic conditions, and occupant control over lighting and thermal comfort. It may also include the functional aspects of space, such as whether the layout provides easy access to tools and people when needed and whether there is sufficient space for occupants. Building managers and operators can increase the satisfaction of building occupants by considering all of the aspects of indoor environmental quality rather than narrowly focusing on temperature or air quality alone. Americans spend the majority of their time indoors. Not surprisingly, studies have shown an increase in worker productivity when improvements are made to a space's indoor environmental quality. Adequate ventilation and exhaust is important to prevent buildup of odors, carbon dioxide, allergens, and toxins in indoor air. Ventilation can take many different forms. Very generally, a system can be categorized into about a half dozen generic types. The first is no ventilation. This is almost certainly the most common option in American homes. There is no mechanical system to remove stale indoor air and moisture or bring in fresh outside air. In the distant past, when buildings weren't insulated, this strategy worked reasonably well relying on the natural leakiness of the house. It's worth noting, though, that even a leaky house doesn't ensure good ventilation. For this strategy to work, there has to be either a breeze outside or a significant difference in temperature between outdoors and indoors. Either of these conditions creates a pressure difference between indoors and out, driving that ventilation. On calm days in the spring and summer, there might be very little air exchange, even in a really leaky house. Next is natural ventilation. In this rather uncommon strategy, specific design features are incorporated to bring in fresh air and get rid of stale air. One approach is to create a solar chimney in which air is heated by the sun, 
becomes more buoyant and rises up and out through air vents near the top of the building. This lowers the pressure in the house, which draws fresh air in through spe specially placed inlet ports. The next one is exhaust only me mechanical ventilation. This is a relatively common strategy in which small exhaust fans, usually in bathrooms, operate either continuously or intermittently to exhaust stale air and moisture generated in those rooms. This strategy creates a modest negative pressure in the house that pulls in fresh air from either through cracks in the walls or other air leakage sites or through strategically placed intentional makeup air inlets. An advantage to, of this strategy is its simplicity and low cost. A disadvantage is that the negative pressure can pull in radon and other soil gases that we don't want in our houses. Next is supply only ventilation. As the name implies, a fan brings in fresh air and stale air escapes through cracks and air leakage sites in the house. The air supply may be delivered to one location dispersed through ducts or supplied to the ducted distribution set system of a forced air heating system for dispersal. A supply only ventilation system pressurizes a house, which can be a good thing in keeping radon and other contaminants from entering the house, but it risks forcing moisture laden air into wall and ceiling cavities where condensation and moisture problems can occur. Balanced ventilation, which is a much better ventilation and is provided through a system, balanced system in which separate fans drive both inlet and out exhaust airflow. This allows us to control where the fresh air comes in and where that air is delivered and from where the exhaust air is drawn. Balanced ventilation systems can be either point to source or ducted. With ducted systems, it makes sense to deliver fresh air to spaces that are most lived areas, such as living rooms and bedrooms, and exhaust indoor air from places where moisture or pollutants are generated, such as bathrooms, kitchens, or a hobby room. Finally, we have balanced ventilation with heat recovery. If there are separate fans to introduce fresh air and exhaust indoor air, it makes a lot of sense to locate these fans together and include an air-to-air -air heat exchanger so that the air go, air outgoing house air will be preconditioned to the incoming outdoor air. This air-to-air -air heat exchanger, more commonly referred to today as a heat recovery ventilator or HRV, is the way to go in colder climates. A slightly different version known as energy recovery ventilator or ERV doesn't transfer moisture in the winter or in the too, because it's too humid in the summer. Volatile organic compounds or VOCs are toxics found within products such as paints, adhesives, cleaners, carpets, particle board, etc and that are released into a space's indoor air, thus harming its quality. Low VOC products are those that meet or exceed various standards for low emitting materials. Adhesives are substances that use to bind one surface to another. They include bonding primers and adhesive primers for plastics. Adhesives often emit high levels of harmful VOCs, so care must be taken to ventilate spaces when using them. Many low or no VOC adhesive products are also available and should be used where feasible. Binders are used to hold together two or more ingredients. They are similar to adhesives and must be used with care. Binders can have high levels of harmful VOCs, which can be dangerous to human health and environment. Lower VOC binders are preferable and all spaces where binders are applied should be well ventilated. To accommodate housing and industry needs while keeping global warming within 1.5 degrees Celsius, 100% of new buildings must be net zero by 2030. Achieving this goal requires new technology for waste and energy efficiency and for the decarbonization 
of construction and building materials. The following slides are some of the cutting edge technologies being implemented to make building environments more sustainable. The following are innovations being implemented into new green building structures. First is creating a photovoltaic window using a coating made from photovoltaic cells. The cost effective coating is transparent like glass and maintains the same insulation as standard windows, but it absorbs solar energy to generate electricity. It's currently being used in commercial and residential applications, along with the potential for use wherever glass panes and windows are being used, such as greenhouses, smartphones, and vehicles. Buildings create 40% of emissions in the United States. Energy efficient software and re remote sensor technology, which monitors the carbon and the energy efficiency of buildings, is becoming more actionable as and for implementing changes as the building is operated on a day-to-day -day basis. Over 1 million tons of plastic is produced each day and less than 9% is recycled per year. <clears throat> Bifusion leverages the, the positives of plastic, its resiliency and flexibility to create a building material they call bi-block. Plastic waste is collected, shredded, and superheated to make the BiBlock product, a diverse and unique indoor-outdoor commercial-grade building material. No adhesive or other materials is required. The process doesn't create waste, and building with the BiBlock product doesn't require a specialized labor. Emissions from manufacturing, transporting, and installing building materials will make up nearly half of carbon emissions from new construction over the next three decades. Concrete can make up half of that carbon footprint or more. To shrink this carbon footprint, the company Carbon Cure uses concrete to sequester carbon. The finished concrete product is actually stronger thanks to the addition of carbon. Their technology can be retrofitted into existing concrete plants with no upfront co capital costs or interruption to operations. And finally, conventional air conditioning is putting a massive strain on our climate. Natural gas solutions are another option, but they can be costly for homeowners. The company Dandelion Energy solves these problems with geothermal heating and cooling. Their geothermal system includes a heat pump that circulates warm air in the winter and cool air in the summer. Currently, their geothermal services are available in the Northeast United States, where they transition existing homes to their geothermal system. There are two sides to every coin, hence there is a con for every pro. Green buildings are highly beneficial, yes, but what are their shortcomings, if there is any? Here are the major ones. First is the high initial investment. Even though the returns are great over time, the initial investment is still a major problem in green buildings. People want to live healthily but can't afford the initial cost of construction. Depending on how many eco-friendly technologies you want to implement in your building, the cost may be even higher. Yet the initial investment is still very high due to the unavailability of the resources needed to build a green building. However, if you shy away from the green buildings because of their high price, you should start considering them. It would help to think of the initial cost of the construction of a green building and the total amount saved over time instead. Next is getting the right material. It can be far-fetched to get the materials needed to construct green buildings. They are often not often available in every part of the world and might take a while and cost a lot to ship. Also, aside from materials needed to construct the building, other materials such as technologies needed might be difficult to find. The related technologies to green building are still slightly new, so it might be hard to purchase or identify the best beneficial technology for the building. 
Sometimes the technologies might be limited by some factors, making it harder to purchase the right choice for the building. Next is the longer time to build. Constructing a green building takes a while. A lot goes into the planning and designing before being built. Building a green building can take up to three years and above because you must consider the surroundings. Next is uncontrollable air temperature. Often, it is not easy to control the air temperature in green buildings. These eco-friendly buildings utilize the sun to generate power, thus they run on heat, and the air is controlled from one central point. Thus, green buildings are not suitable for hot areas as they are designed to use ventilation systems threatening the initial goal of green buildings. Therefore, you might have difficulty controlling your indoor air temperature. Location. Figuring out the right location is another disadvantage of green buildings. It is primarily because of climatic changes. Green buildings utilize the sunlight as much as possible, so using energy alternatives such as solar, building in a region with very few sunny days would be a wrong location because you would likely run out of energy at some point. And finally, unavailability, unavailability of workers with expertise. For greenhouse buildings, it might be challenging to find workers with expertise both for repairing and building your technologies or initially constructing your building. The industry is relatively new, hence it might be difficult for you to find experienced workers to help with you with any issues in your building.